Bom dia, buenos dias, good morning. It's my pleasure uh, to reintroduce Professor Howard Witter, Imperial College of London. Uh, my name is Eduardo Mario Mendiondo, chairing the School of Advanced Studies on Water and Society Under Change. And this lecture is part of a cycle of lectures uh, being made in the Brazilian territory uh, and spread by several graduate programs uh, uh, at the School of uh, Engineering in San Carlos at the University of Sao Paulo. Thank you very much, Howard, for, uh, for sharing with us your knowledge, experience, and brainstorming about that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a change of topic from that advertised, and um, <laughs> it follows from the um, discussions we were having yesterday. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest, um, not only Bruno, but also the group here, in um, issues of uh, land use management. And I'm going to talk about um, the last big project I did before I left the UK. And this was motivated by stakeholders um, from two perspectives. It was, first of all, um, there was a national concern about flood risk. So the UK um, in the 70s and 80s was relatively flood free. Um, and people got used to not having floods. And then we went into a more flood rich period. And so one of the questions that was asked was what is the role of changing land use in the rural environment, in the headwaters of our rivers, um, has that caused an increase in flood risk? And conversely, um, if it has, what can we do to use land use management to help mitigate flood risk? And on, on the other hand, the project I'm going to talk to you about, um, the Pont Bren experiment, um, was motivated by a consortium of farmers in Wales, um, sheep farmers, um, they operated as a collaborative group of independent farms with the leader, Roger Dukes, and they had become increasingly concerned about changes that they'd seen in their landscape. So particularly increased flood runoff, um, large-scale erosion in the streams, um, and what they perceived as a degradation of the environment. And they very much saw themselves as stewards of the landscape, and they wanted to know um, what could be done to help improve their local situation. <clears throat> Earlier in the week, I talked about a national program called LOCAR in the UK, where we got together to uh, address some of the issues of lowland groundwater-dominated catchments. This was another national initiative called the Flood Risk Management Consortium, FRMRC. And again, that brought together um, many different universities and research institutes to work on a whole range of flooding issues. And I um, was part of the originator of that project and led the work on, uh, on, on land management. And it's very closely involved with the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, which um, used to be called the Institute of Hydrology. And the deputy director of the Institute of Hydrology used to be Robin Clark before he came to Brazil and became a Brazilian. <laughs> um, so um, there's quite a lot of people involved, and I'm going to talk about some field research, and then I'm going to talk about some modeling research, and um, I'll give you some publications uh, afterwards. So here are the, um, the sort of top-down questions that were being asked. Has change, have changes in agricultural land use and land management increased flood risk? And um, uh, how can we predict the impacts both at the local scale and the river basin scale. And then conversely, can land management be used to reduce flood risk? And this was in response to some major floods, particularly in the, in the west, in the uh, rivers like the Severn, which drain from the Welsh uplands. Um, these are very hard questions. Uh, some of the hardest questions in hydrology about these subtle changes in land management and what impacts. So, um, um, so the science issues are, um, first of all, um, that the experimental data on land management 
um, is mostly focused around the lowlands and arable agriculture. But in the UK, the headwaters of the major rivers, um, particularly those rivers in the west, are dominated by upland agriculture, and a lot of that is to do with grazing uh, and uh, livestock. And then um, there's some real challenges around how do we model these effects which can be quite subtle um, and very much dependent on local circumstances and how do we understand the local situation and then scale it up. So what we needed was some data so that we could understand what was happening at the local scale. We had um, a lot of anecdotal information from the farmers um, but we needed some hard data, um, and we needed data that ran across different scales, so from fields to small basins up to large basins. Um, and then we needed to think our way through the challenge of how to model all this. So um, this was a, a program that ran for a number of years, involved many people, and it had a couple of phases. Um, the Time that, um, at the time that it was set up, there had been some guidance from government. Gov DEFRA is the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and they'd um, commissioned a couple of projects. Um, one that uh, Ender O'Connell did, um, saying that really the evidence base was inadequate, and they'd played around with some regionalization methods using soil classifications to try and get some insights. And then Keith Bevan ran a study looking at um, catchment scale data across the UK and trying to see whether there was a signal of land use, rural land use change in the climate data, and he couldn't detect it. Um, so the kind of analytical approach to regionalize didn't, didn't work. So um, this national concern came at the same time as a consortium of farmers was raising concerns locally and regionally, and uh, they're based around a place called Pont Bren, um, and um, the farmers are um, mostly livestock farmers, a lot of sheep and some cattle, and this is part of the headwaters of the River Severn, which is one of the major rivers in the west of England, and um, Wales is quite a wet area, so we're talking about a couple of meters of rain a year here, uh, many rain days in the year. So the landscapes are quite wet, and um, it's necessary to, it's for the farmers to use the land, it's necessarily to improve it. And what they mean by that is um, applying a certain amount of fertilizer and also some drainage, some land drainage. And the land drainage is mainly through tile drains. And part of the landscape is undrained and it's not really usable. Um, the main activity is um, sheep, um, but there is some, some uh, cattle used for both beef and dairy production. So this is the kind of landscape that we're talking about. Um, so it's a sort of rolling uh, hill slopes, and here are the sheep that we're concerned about. And um, the farmers had seen bigger flood flows than they'd seen in their life. I mean, the farmers here have been here for generations. And on the whole, the, the Roger Dukes, um, at the time, a man of about 65, he'd spent his entire life in this area and his family before him. And they were seeing flows in the river that they hadn't seen before and changes in the river landscape. And one of the mitigating measures that they'd been thinking about was, first of all, well, there are two. First of all, trying to reduce the density of animals. Um, and, and, and secondly, um, the weight of the animals. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But also trying to reintroduce trees into the landscape. Um, because um, there was a local um, forestry um, uh, NGO that was very keen to promote the idea that trees would improve the soil structure and that would allow more infiltration and that would reduce the flood flows. So they'd already taken on board these ideas of, of tree planting as maybe a way of helping with the problem. So um, 
here is the uh, collaborative, and this is uh, Roger Dukes. So there's half a dozen farms and farm families, uh, 10 farms, and um, uh, the area's uh, around 1,000 hectares. And um, uh, they, Roger was um, kind of a typical farmer, really, but um, a very charismatic guy in a, in a very quiet and reserved way, but a real leader uh, for this um, for this group, and ultimately, the group became very influential, and the work that, that we were doing with them and they were doing with us, they then became evangelists, and they conveyed the results to other farm communities, and they also created a link to the government of Wales. Welsh, uh, the Welsh Assembly is an, an independent government within the United Kingdom, and they. Um, established a channel of communication because they were very concerned that the legislation rela related to farming that was coming through government was really inappropriate and ill-informed. And so they established a real presence at a, a national level. So they were interested in increasing use of trees, reducing the stocking, and also restoring some wetlands. So the background to um, this is, is quite stark. Um, so agriculture in the UK has been very influenced by the European Union common market and agricultural policy. And um, that put um, a lot of incentive to improve, to increase the stocking density and change the agricultural practices. So um, this is um, some examples that um, uh, they were um, running uh, 147 ewes and 80 lambs in the early 1970s. And the weight of the sheep, the ewe is a female sheep, 35 kilograms. And then when we got to the 90s, they were running 1,000 animals, okay? So six times as many animals and um, 65 kilos instead of 35 kilos. So you may think sheep are sheep are sheep, but actually six times as many sheep and they're twice as heavy. And that has an effect on the landscape. And what it does is to compact the grazing areas, and that reduces the infiltration and increases the overland flow, and hence the stream flow. So they were, <clears throat> by the time uh, that the slide was put together, they were starting to try and reduce the numbers um, as a way of recovering the situation and starting to look at planting trees so we um, set out to do some experiments to quantify uh, what was going on. And um, one of the things that we did was to establish some plots, some manipulation plots, um, in which we had um, grazing, uh, no grazing, and tree planting. Um, and then we set up some experiments at the scale of hill slopes where we monitored the flow in the pastures and the infiltration, um, the surface runoff and the subsurface runoff, and also instrumented some of these tree shelter belts that had been established for a few years. And of course, we monitored the stream at different locations. So there were four sets of manipulation plots, and here we have one of them to show you the scale. Um, and so we did a lot of work on um, collecting the overland flow and looking at the soil moisture dynamics uh, in those plots. Um, and then we set up a major experiment uh, on hill slope. So we had um, some wells to look at the groundwater dynamics. Um, we collected runoff in, uh, in gutters and we instrumented with um, uh, soil moisture sensors um, and we, of course, put um, uh, a, a, a MET station in. And we did the same sort of thing in a shelter belt that was towards the base of the slope. So um, uh, this is um, a, a photographic view of the site. And the dotted lines show that the subsurface tar drains there. So the tar drains were mapped. And we monitored the flow in the tar drains. and. Um, the red are places where we were looking at soil moisture profiles, and the blue are gutters where we were picking up um, surface runoff and so on. So this is the kind of setup. Um, we've got uh, neutron probe access tubes for soil moisture. 
Um, we've got um, uh, the drainage pipes being monitored with a very large tipping bucket. Clunk, clunk. Um, weather stations. Here's our um, uh, overland flow collectors. Um, and this is all monitored in, in real time. Um, so um, we had some woodland strips. And one of the things we did in those was to look at interception losses because Wales is a very interesting climate. It's very wet and it's very windy. So for those of you that don't know, um, a tree can store, can hold on its leaf canopy um, one or two millimeters of water. Um, and that's not very much. But that one or two millimeters can evaporate at a very high rate. So if you have rainfall, no rainfall, rainfall, no rainfall, rainfall, no rainfall, every time this one or two millimeters fills and then it evaporates. So over a year, it's a very, very large part of the water balance. So it's important to measure these things. Um, here are some of our stream gauging sites. Um, we put in some little weirs and stage recorders. And um, this was all nested within a small catchment. So the river basin area is in red. Um, here we've got the main streams in blue. Um, this area is um, improved pasture. Up here you can see the different colors that's undrained and unimproved and generally very boggy. And here's our hill slope experiment. And the uh, numbers indicate various different um, flow measurement sites and so on. So we had quite a lot of instrumentation. So tensiometers for measuring the suction in the soil at different depths. Neutron probe allows us to measure soil moisture. An automatic weather station. Um, five rain gauges to give us the spatial distribution of the area, plus four storage gauges. Um, various <coughs> weirs to measure drain flow and overland flow, and some tipping buckets to measure drain flow and overland flow, and so on and so forth. 13 stream flow sites, six through four collectors, and then 39 rain gauges within the tree canopy. So a lot of data points, 144,000 data points a week being collected. So this was an operation that basically took two people full time um, to run the, uh, the network. Um, so <coughs> some of the results from the plot scale were interesting. Um, there were huge improvements in the soil hydraulic conductivity and the soil physical properties generally over a period of just one to two years, increasing soil infiltration rates and reducing overland flow. So we were very surprised by how rapid the soil structural changes were in this environment. Um, and then we look at the, um, the natural runoff, the hill scale processes. You can see that overland flow is very extensive, um, but also drain flow was dominant. And so this little diagram on the right hand side shows rain at the top and the drain flow at the bottom. And here we've got the rain at the top and the overland flow at the bottom. So what you can see is that drain flow is the dominant runoff mechanism. But when we get intense events, that's also triggers overland flow. Um, and then there was a big issue of how our, um, sorry, um, yeah, that, this, is, this, is, this is the same story. So um, here we've got um, um, a diagram that shows the climatic variability. So we've got December, which is a wet winter month in the UK in 2005, and that was a dry December. And here we've got December 2006, which is a wet December. And you can see this, the pattern that I showed you, that the drain flow in black is dominant, and the overland flow just comes in bursts with extreme rainfall. And so here are some overall statistics. Um, that The drain flow is something like 40% of the rainfall, and the overlo overland flow um, in, in, in um, 
uh, varies between 16% and, and, and 3%. So it's a very wet landscape. The drains are critically important. Any hydrological modeling has got to reproduce those. Um, so um, here are some of the data from uh, the bowl showing the saltwater pressure. So for those of you that um, aren't too familiar with soil physics, um, the soil normally is unsaturated, and that means that there's a, a suction in the soil pores. The pressure is less than atmospheric. But uh, when the soil is fully saturated, then the pressure goes positive. So that's what we're seeing in these time series. So we're seeing an unsaturated soil, and then it runs for very long periods being saturated. It dries out, resaturates, and then dries out. So the winter condition is extensive periods of saturation. And uh, this, in the summer, um, the soil is typically unsaturated. So we get a lot of insight into the dynamics of this system by measuring things like soil pressure th using very simple devices. A, a tensiometer just is a little um, tube with a ceramic tip that you push into the soil and you measure the pressure. Um, and some interesting differences in soil moisture. So um, uh, we used a neutron probe. A neutron probe was, is, is a source of fast neutrons. You lower it down a tube into the soil. And when it sees moisture, those fast neutrons are slowed, and you get a direct measure of uh, volumetric moisture content. And these were taken manually twice a week. And so this shows some of the systematic variations. Um, and what you can see here is moisture content with depth um, and at different locations. And the drier locations are within the tree shelter belts. So the trees are actually drying out the soil, and that means that when it rains, there's more potential for storage in the soil profile. So the drains are moving the water very fast, um, but where we don't have drains, we have overland flow, and that's even faster. Um, when we have the tree, we, trees, we're putting more water into the soil, and that water is being evaporated by the trees, and it's drying out the soil, and it's creating some natural storage in the soil. So that would attenuate the flows. Uh, OK. So uh, there are just some time series. Um, interception is important. Uh, so here is the rain that's falling um, over a period from December 2006 to uh, January 2007 uh, accumulated. So we've got a, about 160 millimeters of rainfall over that period of a few weeks. And you can see that the rain that actually reaches the ground is maybe 60% of that. So although that interception storage is tiny, it's taking 40% of the water balance. So it's a really important effect. Um, and then there's a question of how fast the water flows through the soil. So <clears throat> we did some modeling and optimization, but we also did some Tests on soil cores, very simple. You just push a cylinder into the ground, um, saturate the soil profile, and run some water through it. And then you can measure the hydraulic conductivity. And where we have trees, it's high. And where we have the pasture, it's low. In this case, a factor of three. In other cases, we had an order of magnitude or more difference. Um, for those of you who don't um, know much about Soils, they're very heterogeneous. And this um, is a nice example of one of our soil profiles where we use dye to map the infiltration. And this just shows um, where the dye has penetrated preferentially. So um, soil is, is um, a complex, um, very much determined by root systems um, and the water flows in preferential paths. So the kind of architecture of the tree roots is quite important in terms of how the water is redistributed. So we also have um, differences in response between the areas that are improved. So these have been drained and fertilized, and areas that have not been improved. Um, so um, 
Here's our, uh, our, our catchment again. And um, uh, here we've got um, a period of rainfall that we're observing over the winter of uh, 2006. Um, and um, you can see, um, let's just see, sites four, five, six, and eight. Um, so here are uh, six and eight. Um, and here are four and five. Um, and um, there's general similarities um, between uh, many of these sites uh, on the improved pasture, but the undrained is generally wetter and has higher peaks and longer base flows. Um, the question is how representative is our little bowl that we were studying of the bigger catchments. So we superimpose the hydrographs and um, you can see that the bowl is in red um, and those um, gauged subcatchments are in black. Um, and for the drained areas, the response is really very similar. And for the undrained area, it isn't. So the undrained area, much wetter, more runoff, uh, longer periods of continuous flow. So that told us that um, our little experiment um, at the small hill slope scale was actually reproducing the kind of response we were seeing at the small catchment scale. So what do we conclude from the experiments? The drain flow and overland flow are the dominant runoff processes at the hill slope scale. Um, we had a, a very interesting dry summer in 2006. And the soils, which are heavy clay, cracked and introduced porosity, macro porosity. And after that, the overland flow significantly reduced. Um, there were major differences between the grazed grassland and the tree planted areas. And the throughfall data reminded us of how important this little wetting of the trees is one to two millimeters, um, but re continuous. Rain, no rain, rain, no rain, every time we're losing one or two millimeters. So 40% of the rainfall being lost. So trees are important because they evaporate this water, but also they dry out the soil. And um, we could see in the stream uh, and the ditch flow data the differences between the different land managements of the drained and improved areas and the undrained areas. OK, there's uh, some issues around sediment. Um, so the sediment supply rates um, were really high in the agricultural intensive areas. So the farms were concerned about this loss of soils. <coughs> and um, there were also some issues around um, nutrients. So the agricultural improved landscape had been fertilized and also had animals on it. So there was a much larger export of nutrients uh, through that area. So that's just a little run through um, the experiments. The question is, what do we do to capture that response in models? And that's a, a challenging um, issue. So what we did was to uh, use very detailed physically based models at the very small scale. So we represented our hill slope in very great detail. So we were measuring, uh, we were <coughs> modeling the vertical soil profile was something like one centimeter resolution. We included the effect of the drains, which we uh, knew where they were. Um, we had information from our plot scale um, data and our hill slope scale data to allow us to infer the physical properties. Um, so we had this very detailed physically based modeling, and that could be used to explore the effects of land management, including planting trees. <coughs> the problem we had was that that model was much too detailed to take to a larger scale. And so what we did was to develop um, a simple model that could be used and trained using the detailed model. Um, we, we call this meta-modeling. And uh, we could take that simpler model up to the larger scales. So. Um, this is the idea of the uh, meta model. We've got very detailed response at the hill slope scale. And we've got a physically based model structure and its parameterization. And then we're going to develop a rather simple 
hydrological model based on some simple stores, and it has its set of parameters um, that we train based on the hill slope model. <coughs> so our physical model um, was fairly classical. It solves Richard's equation. Um, it represents the different source structures, and at the bottom it's got a drain flow. It um, allows various assumptions to be made about macro porosity, the preferential flow. Um, it allows for the interception of uh, water by the tree canopy, which we've seen is important. Um, it was um, quite a complicated model built by Beth Jackson, one of our research students. Um, and then with that, we could look at the effects of vegetation change, for example, the contrast between grass and trees, and also the effects of compaction on soil structure. Um, so we could um, look at the effects of um, uh, grazed grassland here, showing the flood peaks in blue. And then if we have grassland which has a shelter belt at the base of the hill, which accepts the overland flow and allows it to infiltrate, then you can see we're having a very large reduction um, in the runoff peaks. So um, that's a, a result at the fine scale. Um, so we then ran various scenarios. So here we've got a grazed and drained grassland. Uh, here we've got some low trees. Here we've got some high trees. Um, here we've got an ungrazed drained grassland. Here we've got holy woodland. Um, here we've got drained grassland with trees running um, across the uh, base of the hill slope. And so we can play around with these management strategies and look at what they're doing in terms of flood flows. We then, having looked at the detail at the local scale, we move up scale um, and uh, we train our simple model. Our simple model is uh, just like this. It's got three buckets um, and it has um, <coughs> half a dozen parameters. So it's fairly parsimonious. And um, it can do a pretty good job at reproducing the detail model response. Um, so it's not perfect, but um, it's pretty effective in being able to capture these um, uh, dynamics of the system. Um, and so then we can run this um, detail model, uh, uh, sorry, we can run the meta model for um, uh, different options. And we can apply it to every field across this catchment. And then we can look at scenarios at the scale of catchment. <coughs> so <coughs> this is um, a quite, quite a complicated diagram, but essentially um, the blue is the land use as of about 2000, um, where we already had some trees planted in the system. If we had not planted those trees, we'd got the red response. If we were to plant trees over the whole area, which means wiping out all the agricultural production, then we're down to the green. <clears throat> so the basic message is that um, uh, tree shelter belts can significantly reduce these flood peaks. If we were to plant woodland over the whole area, it would have a very dramatic effect. Now, the point, important point here is this is just a run of data that happened to occur in January, February, March, and April 2007. What happens if you get a really big event? So in terms of flood risk, what we're seeing is that these frequent events, the land management has a really big impact. So what we then did was to take a very large rainstorm that had been observed somewhere else and run that on our system. So this is a sort of a one in a hundred year storm event. And the question is, what does this land management do for us in terms of mitigating the floods? And the answer is not very much, not very much. So the story is that this land use has a really big impact for small flows, but the big flows, it's a small impact. Um, there we are. And some statistics, um, so we've got um, some uncertainty limits on this, but the median results are that um, with um, the playing around with shelter belts, we can make a 5% difference. 
So this is um, an interesting and important point. Um, so there are lots of benefits to putting shelter belts into this landscape. Uh, it's good in terms of sediments, it's good in terms of nutrients, it's good in terms of habitats, but it's not going to solve a flood problem. It's going to help, um, but it's not going to solve the problem. And um, there's a very interesting argument still running in the UK um, nearly two decades later because there's a real push for green infrastructure in the rural landscape to help flood risk. And it's actually slightly misinformed because for sure it's a benefit, but if you're in a house that's getting flooded, it's not going to stop your house getting flooded. It'll just mean that the level of flooding will be a bit lower. Um, so it's a very interesting issue. So anyway, uh, I thought this would be an interesting story to share with you. Um, it's, I think that uh, land use and land management, some of the most difficult challenges in hydrology. Um, as we've seen, these effects of management practices can be subtle but quite profound. Um, we've also seen that um, while measures can improve things a lot for small events, if you get a lot of rain, you're going to get a lot of runoff, irrespective. Um, so they're not really um, competing with structural solutions. Um, if you've got a major flood problem, a 5% difference is not going to solve it for you. Um, okay, um, we did other work um, on some other types of problem. There's another problem in the uplands of the UK of extensive peat areas that have been drained. Um, and um, conservationists are very keen to restore the wetlands and block up those drains. And so we did the same kind of thing here. We built a very detailed model um, and uh, used that to explore the impacts. And that's some work done by Caroline Ballard here. Um, at the end of this project, we put together an international workshop um, and at that point, I was leaving the UK and Neil McIntyre was running the end of the project. And so we have this paper that was a sort of review summary of modeling rural land use change. When I went to Canada, I landed with various jobs. And one of the jobs was to chair a committee looking at um, the relationship between agriculture and water. So there's a thing called the Council of Canadian Academies, which combines um, the, the different um, academies of science and engineering in Canada. They appoint a panel of experts, which I chaired, to look at water and agriculture. And there's um, a report that we produced in um, 2013, which is available free to download. And it talks about um, a whole range of issues around water and agriculture, but it does include some discussion of beneficial management practices. Incidentally, in Canada, we talk about BMPs as beneficial management practices, because best management practices is a slightly difficult term, because what is best, and in what sense is it best? Beneficial. Beneficial, beneficial yeah. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> Many thanks, Howard, for this inspiring, inspiring uh, uh, lecture. Oh, um, I, I should say, um, just to repeat, that um, this was a project that really originated by farmers. So they welcomed us with open arms because yeah. they had these problems. And um, in terms of the interaction with farmers, we actually lived with them. So when we visited, we stayed in their houses and paid them money. Um, and we also paid them for the rent of the land that we were using. Um, but, of course, every night we'd go back and discuss our results and they'd tell us what was bothering them. And, so, and then occasionally we had, uh, periodically we had meetings with them as a community with them and their families. So it was a, one of the most um, rewarding experiences, actually. It was great. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. very good. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, I have shared with you an email uh, 25 years ago I <laughs> took with Kate Bevan and Robert Clark, mm -hmm. also uh, visiting farmers in, 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 in the countryside of southern Brazil, also uh, trying to know how they were dealing with erosion mm -hmm. patterns mm -hmm. in, in, 
on this specific climate and landscape. And also, uh, every time when we visit the, the, the landowners, the farmers, we, uh, we learn. Mm -hmm. We learn about several things we have not found out in the books, mm -hmm. in the textbooks, even in the papers. But of course, the new papers are always better because after this experience. So yeah. it's a very inspiring experience. Uh, so thank you also for this uh, lecture about experimental hydrology, hy physical hydrology is very important. Um, uh, my first question, the first to warm up the discussion, is about the scale. Uh, the scale that means the scale of the experiment and the scale of the extreme when you model the scenario effects with and without. Uh, of course, it is expected that during a, a normal year, we have very small, uh, I would say, 10% uh, of the duration curve is related to flooding, so, so to big floods or something like that. And it is expected that the other 90% and so on is related to medium size or lowlands, no, no rainy days. <clears throat> and of course, uh, my question is, uh, what will happen with the rest of, of the days without uh, uh, rain, rains. That means the, the low flows, how they will react or they did react with and without these uh, 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 forest conversion scenarios. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, any, any answer about that? Sure. Um, well, um, if you um, plant a lot of woodland in this environment, you lose a lot more water through um, evaporation of interception. Um, so um, uh, the more trees you have, <coughs> the less water you have in the stream. <coughs> as far as putting shelter belts in, those don't have a huge area on a catchment scale proportionately, um, but they do affect the soil properties. And similarly, if you reduce the density of grazing, the soil properties improve. So that basically puts more water into the soil. It reduces overland flow, and hence um, it reduces the peak flows in the stream uh, and, and, and increases the low flows. That is uh, the point about mm. the environmental services mm. that you, Julian, and others are... Mm. Because that is the discussion. Sometimes the farmers are seeing that when they have conversion, the, the, the soil moisture is, is closer to, mm. to, to, the, to the ground, surface, so on. And this appears that they are producing, so they have the feeling that they are producing more water uh, with forests. So uh, the big discussion is in Brazil is also about the scale, because if you like more runoff coming to the reservoirs, you don't need uh, forests. You need uh, no forests about that. So uh, there is a big discussion. This is still. Uh, uh, very important in Brazil, that people also believe that you need a tree to produce water. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, 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 uh, uh, this statement, this argument is not full because it depends on the scale. Uh, and this is, you have and a very interesting paper about Ericsson and, and people in the, in five years ago. You have two approaches, one from the demand that is the demand, you put a tree that you have more losses in, in the, the scale, the local scale, and uh, uh, high, low, lower runoff. Huh? But in the other scale, like Amazon River Basin, if you put, to, to take out all the forests, you have not the, the entire cycle. So it's another approach, and it's depending yeah. on the scale. So, so, so depending what scale we are dealing with, we need to take care about the analgeneralization about the hydrological cycle. Yes. That's, uh, so that's very important in education. So you know? these scales that I've been talking about, if we, we, um, we've worked here at the scale of kilometers squared. We have actually done work to upscale to the whole of Wales, for example. But, but you're talking about very large scales like the Amazon, where you're impacting local climate. So here we're not impacting local climate. At the very large scale, you certainly are. We've done quite a lot of work on fine-scale atmospheric modeling in Canada. Um, and um, we can see storms moving up um, from the US 
precipitating on the prairies, evaporating from the prairies, feeding rainfall that then produces floods in the Rocky Mountains. Um, so at the large scale, these feedback effects can be very big. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, about environmental service, ecosystem services, is it not coming a question? I am waiting a question from the ecosystem service group. My name is Julian. Uh, in my PhD, I work with uh, ecosystem services, but I don't actually have a question, but I have like two little pieces of my experience from, from my masses. The first one is about not only scale is important, but also when we ana you analyze infiltration and overland flow, it's important to take into account the growth stage, because it depends on the, the stage of, of the, the vegetation growth stage, the, the water consumption is different, the evapotranspiration is different. And we carried out a study when we analyzed the effects of the, the beneficial practice on a basin <clears throat> and its impact on the base flow. And we found that um, there was a trending increase in the base flow. And I think what is important when you lead with the reservoir operation is the maintenance. Yeah. So that's why it's important to analyze not only the stream flow, but also the base flow. And my second... Well, let me just comment on that, maybe, because um, um, it promotes, provokes me to say that um, in Canada, there's some really interesting issues about agriculture and the way it's changed. Um, and the area that I was living in is semi-arid. Some years you get no runoff, some years you get a lot, but it's mostly traditionally been spring snowmelt. Um, and what the farmers have done over the last um, 10 or 20 years is they've moved from a situation where they till the ground to a situation where they predominantly do not till. Um, and that really allows the development of natural soil structure. Um, it improves the infiltration in the soil. It improves the stored soil water for the crop that comes the following summer. Um, and so just to what you might think is a subtle intervention, zero till, actually has quite a profound effect on the hydrology. So I think your question, your comment about um, cropping is really important because um, crops have a life cycle, but also how we manage them um, can have quite significant effects, uh, particularly where we've got um, a fine balance between precipitation and evaporation. So, yeah. yeah. And it also connects with my second point that um, I worked on a project where I evaluated the many, ma uh, many agricultural management. And we identified that the most important is how you manage your cropland and how you ma manage your grazing. Um, we evaluated the um, rotational grazing and we found that um, the most, the grazing with the most stocking rate the, the high stocking rate was the one that promoted more infiltration and less soil erosion because uh, as you rotate the cattle in the paddocks, you allow the soil to regenerate. Mm -hmm. So um, you quite, produce quite more. Rapidly? Quite rapidly? It actually depends yeah. because uh, in our area, we have like a, a very rainy season and uh, afterwards, we have like a dry season in the middle of the year. Mm. So when you pay attention to the, to the vegetation height, so you can have like an adaptive management where you, when you have more rainfall, you have more vegetation growth. So yeah. the regeneration is faster. But when you have like a water sorted period, of course, you have to produce less, have more, uh, has less cattle, grazing the land. So I think the key point is 
the agriculture production has to move forward like an adaptive management. Uh, more, stu more studies allowing um, to understand the climate dynamics and its effect on the agricultural production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, th I think, um, you know, for quite a long time, we've understood the basics of urbanization and we know what happens when we cover natural catchments with paved areas and roofs. Um, but um, hydrologists are still really at the beginning of trying to understand these subtle agricultural effects at the field and at the catchment scale. And there's been something of a disjoint between kind of agricultural hydrology and catchment hydrology. But I think it's a really important area and a very interesting area. I mean, for example, some of the questions I was interested in in, the, in Canada, was, um, which we never answered. I mean, the prairies used to be natural 100 years ago. Um, and now they're intensively managed. So what did the environment look like 100 years ago? Um, and that's a really interesting question. I'm sure the same questions would apply here. Um, yeah. 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 There's, there's also some in interesting anecdotal issues in Canada. I don't know if you have it here, but we, there was a big beaver population um, uh, until the Europeans came to Canada and they killed all the beavers because the fur was used to make hats. Um, and, um, and what the beavers do, of course, is build dams. Um, and, um, and the dams hold water. Uh, so traditional knowledge from the indigenous people would say that beavers were helping to maintain the ecosystems and maintain water supply in drought times because they created these ponds and now we, we've killed all the beavers. <laughs> we achieved a, a point that I would like to, to have in, in this week. Uh, can we, as an, an a civilization, in the last 100 years we have we have all the, the knowledge about the, the modern hydrology. We are still experiencing the changing view about our hydrology. Some, some things are equal, but some things are being revisited. What's your opinion that perhaps we are uh, riding a cycle that perhaps in the next decades we are putting more attention into ancestral knowledge to revisit our and to refine our uh, point of view of how we are doing hydrology at the traditional term. That means we have a mechanism approach, a mechanical approach to, to, the, to how the, the hydrological cycle is working in a plot, in a headwater, in a river basin. But anyway, we have uh, uh, some uh, small uh, and local actions that sometimes try to put signals in our records. Uh, that means the way that uh, some animals introduce habits into our rivers, even in our banks, and even the nat native uh, uh, communities uh, uh, making some small construction uh, across the rivers. And when you have a record or trying to refine Mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, resimulate an, an ancestral record, we have no this knowledge uh, in our models, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and also when we put models with migration people inside a country or even a continent in another scale. So, what's your opinion? Let's perhaps we are going to have or to shape a more uh, ancestral knowledge related hydrology in the next years. Uh, combining the traditional knowledge mm -hmm. to uh, ancestral knowledge, that this is possible, this could... So, um, I've been in the hydrology business quite a long time, um, since around about um, 1971. <laughs> it's a long time. Um, and um, hydrology at that stage was really simple, and it was very empirical, um, and it was very... It was called engineering hydrology, um, but it was really using um, black box relationships um, and with very little understanding of the processes. So over my career, um, we've seen a huge um, 
expansion of scientific hydrology and, um, and that's now become part of engineering hydrology. So engineers should know all about hydrological science and they should build their models to um, incorporate hydrological science. Um, and um, um, I think we are an empirical subject and we are very generally data limited. Um, that's about to change because we're getting tremendous insights from drones and satellites and uh, missions like SWAT where we can measure our rivers from space and so on. So that will be radically different. But still, the kind of studies that we're talking about here are few and far between. And, um, and in general, to look at problems of agricultural management, um, which are really widespread, people put money into projects which are underfunded, run for a couple of years, and they learn nothing. So in the UK, huge amounts of money have been spent learning nothing because the research has not been long enough. Climate variability often dominates these impacts. And the instrumentation is often not sufficiently detailed to really understand the processes. Uh, what you can understand from a stream gauge is very limited. You really need to go in and measure the components. So I think that um, the scientific hydrology is still um, very limited in terms of really detailed studies. And a lot of those studies have uh, focused on certain areas, particularly humid areas um, and upland areas. And there's large areas um, that are very poorly understood. And I haven't um, yet talked about arid areas, but those are one area where, you know, um, arid zones are where the world's water resources are most limited, and yet we have huge gaps in our knowledge of the hydrology. So that's the sort of discussion about scientific hydrology. It's still, it's made a lot of progress, but we're still, there's a lot of need for people to get out there and measure things in a comprehensive way. Now, indigenous knowledge, um, I think there's a huge amount that we can learn from the past, and we're not very good at it. And indigenous knowledge is one way of encapsulating that. And I think there's some really important insights uh, into how ecosystems have changed that come from traditional knowledge. But traditional knowledge has a lot of baggage associated with it too. Um, so um, indigenous people are very proud of their knowledge. And sometimes it's very insightful and sometimes it's by our standards wrong but they will never say that it's wrong because by their standards it isn't. And uh, that particularly has arisen for me in the case of some water quality issues where people think they know what's happening, but when you do some chemical analysis, something quite different is happening. So I think there's a huge um, empowerment of indigenous people to, um, uh, to uh, um, access their knowledge, but it's, um, a complica it's not as simple a story as taking these tablets of stone from the First Nations, you have to filter that information. I mean, I think um, another interesting aspect of indigenous knowledge is um, that certainly in Canada, um, I think indigenous rights are, are, are going to have a huge impact on how water resources are managed. And Pat has this nice story that you perhaps remember from Phoenix. So the indigenous people in Phoenix won a court case, so they control half of Phoenix's water now. Um, and in Canada, um, there are certain areas where there were treaties and um, water rights are kind of supposedly given to the Europeans. But there are, British Columbia didn't have those, and the First Nations and British Columbia have won very high levels of rights over water. And I think this, in the rest of Canada, people will um, challenge those um, agreements in court because basically the First Nations were screwed over. And, um, and I, so I think there's th their rights to water will become, in countries like Canada, to some extent in the USA and probably here too, will become um, a, an important issue. So uh, lots of interesting issues around the First Nations, but um, certainly in Canada they've had a very rough deal, um, politically. Today we have uh, two top, one of the two tops is uh, sanitation, mm. of course, and indigenous uh, territories mm. uh, about sovereignty or something like that. So mm. 
Uh, well, uh, we are arriving to, 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 to this last part of the discussion. Do you have any questions, more questions? So we can finish this lecture. I would like to thank all people, participants of this morning, also the followers in the internet. Uh, this is, was very Thank you very high. much, guys. Uh, Thank you. Very, <laughs> very <laughs> rocket science in, in, in a term. Uh, that is, was very inspi inspired. I think that you can return back to the repository also to relearn or to refresh uh, the discussion. And I have uh, an invitation for tomorrow. At 8.30, we start with a workshop about San Carlos Water Security 2120. It's 100 ahead, 100 years ahead. So it's a very uh, ground, ground discussion coming from the municipality secretary in the first part. And we have a break. And after that, we have uh, a very experienced man who chaired the sanitation plan for San Carlos. Very, very coming from the experience. So that is the goal of the school mixing people for the academy, from the stakeholder decision making, and from the, from the experience. And this is what will, will be a very uh, inspiring uh, uh, discussion. I would like to invite you all to, to join us tomorrow. Also bring your colleagues here to celebrate this, this moment. So you have another? Yes, actually. We have one question from the people who are watching you on YouTube. Uh, let me see the question, just a moment. Uh, Professor Howard, I wouldn't you know your opinion on how to insert uh, behavior rules of agriculture in hydrological modeling to pr produce uh, scenarios of recovery and preservation in small catchments? Run me through that again, can you? Yes, <laughs> I, I was just reading it. <coughs> so uh, his question is, how is it possible to include the agricultural behavior, mm -hmm. the farmland, farmland owners' behaviors on hydrological modeling to produce scenarios of conservation in small catchments? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question. That question came from the university, Federal University of Campina Grande. Okay, thank you for that question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's a hard question to answer. Um, I think that um, uh, effects of agriculture um, depend very much on uh, the local environment and the local climate. Um, they can be very important. Um, in some climates, they may be less important. Um, certainly, in terms of reproducing hydrological response in detail, uh, it's important to understand crop development and to represent that within a model. Um, it's very important to represent the evaporation processes uh, and with forest crops, particularly to get interception represented correctly. Um, that's a, a, a huge um, issue. In fact, let me just digress. So in the UK, um, we, we have a shortage of long-term experiments, but one was in Wales looking, and it was designed entirely to look at the effects of interception. Um, and there's a sister project in the east of England. The Wales in the west is very wet, and in the east it's very dry. So Wales, you might have two to three metres a rain a year, in the east you might have five to six hundred millimeters. Um, so trees in the west um, make a huge difference to the water balance because interception storage is refilled and emptied and refilled and emptied very frequently. So it can account for 40 percent of the water balance. In the east of England it's dry and the effect is negligible. Um, so subtle issues like that um, can be Im important. And then issues like agricultural management. Do you have till? Do you have zero till? Do you have agricultural drainage? How effective is it? Um, all of these are relevant. So um, the real answer is if you want to understand in detail what's happening at a small scale, it requires quite a lot of hard work um, to understand working with the farmers, 
what their practices are, and then to try and translate that into estimates of the hydrological impacts. Um, so I get quite upset by um, a lot of work that's done on agricultural land management using very simplified models, SWOT being one of those, um, because they tend to take a very simple view of these processes, yet these processes can have very profound impacts on the hydrological response. It's been a particular issue in Canada where we have a lot of frozen soils and models, conventional models do not reproduce that at all well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.